ask you two questions associated with that. First of all, how, where did this targeting of individuals or classification of them as individuals come from? Do you, do you know who was um, well, so identifying them? Yeah, you, you had the, the big targets. So, for example, our soldier, one of the, one of the biggest target was Zakawi, who was named as the head of um, Al Qaeda in Iraq. So he was target number one. And then, as intelligence came in, so which, imagine we're chasing this guy around, sort of the Sunni Triangle and around back there, and we, we don't catch him, but every building we go into, we think is associated with him or is associated with him. So the people in that house then become um, suspects, then we target them for information. Whether they've got valuable information or not, who knows. Um, so one person usually leads to another. Also, if you're paying for intelligence, then um, Say, say someone has got some intelligence about someone who's involved in insurgency and you pay them $200. That might be all the information they know about that, about that involved in insurgency, but they're unemployed, they need, they need, they need money, they can keep coming back and telling you stuff. You know? so a lot of the intelligence we were getting, I wasn't too sure actually about the validity of it. Okay, thanks. Now, in the course of these operations, what sorts of... Um damage was inflicted on individuals and others? Sure, so obviously you had damage to property. Um, Iraq at the time was an unstable and violent country and we would usually um, well, make a hole in the perimeter wall or, or blow the gates off. Um, so straight away we damaged their property and also got rid of any security that that building would have had. So, um, you know, gangs, there's a lot of violent gangs in Iraq, criminal gangs. It would be very easy for them to get in and out of those properties up and bring Then we would damage the, the actual house. Um, so it would blow the front doors and blow a hole in the wall, blow the windows. So that's also creating problems of securing the house afterwards. And um, I often think about the, um, the terrible effect that would have. Imagine 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning, you're asleep in your home, your children in the room next door to you, and all of a sudden there's a huge explosion in your house. The house is in dust, it's dark, and within seconds there's 10, 12, 16 men, armed men, in your house. Um, whether any um, physical harm actually came to any of the people in that building, imagine the psychological effects on the people in that house, the children, you know, the long term psychological effects of that happening to someone. Um, after we'd got into the house and secured the building, we'd be start questioning people and find out who is there. Uh, more often than not, in the time that I was in Iraq, um, the person we were looking for wasn't in the building. Um, on one night, um, I can remember that we did three or four houses in a row, because we, we got the wrong address, and then we went to the next address and the next address. So we carried out that same action on three, three houses, and I know friends of mine who said they'd done that on whole streets, you know, four or five or six houses. Um, Perhaps just one last question before I hand it over to the panel. Um, in terms of the effects on the individuals, did you come across any <coughs> injuries and deaths as a result of your operations when you were there? On the operations that I was involved in, um, no one was killed. Um, but you know of some. But I, I know of, it, there were many operations where people were killed. We came off jobs um, and we've had a joint briefing area. Um, and other units that we were working with very closely, so we would have been doing House A, they would have been doing House B, and in House B, people would have been shot. Um, I was, after a while, I got some, sort of this side to plan on my end because most of the job, or all of the jobs that I was involved in, the shock of um, entry by us meant that there was never any resistance. People would often piss themselves, uh, they'd be crying, you know, even if they had a weapon in the house, and a lot of Families in Iraq have got weapons, it's a very violent place at the time. Uh, no one would be in a right state of mind to use it. So when um, we were having these brief examples and people saying, oh yeah, we shot two people, whatever, I often wondered what the situation could possibly be which led to them um, shooting those people. Also, once we've made entry into these houses and found out who's there, we then set about um, taking all money, computers, weapons, uh, mobile phones from those houses as well, and all males of the military age, so anyone roughly 16 to 60, uh, no matter 
no matter what their name was, no matter if they, we thought they were involved or not, we're taking out those houses and putting it into detention. Thank you. Now, can we hear some questions from the panel? Um, I just have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, that there was a lot of evidence gathering prior to operations, and uh, part of that was questioning people that you already had captured. Sure. Um, were you involved with or you know, aware of any practice of torture right. or violence in this um, gathering? One of the... Um, there's two, two points I'd like to make. The first one is, is that um, when, when you're investigating things like this, I think it's important not to look at the reasons given for doing something, but to actually look at what happened, the actual actions, what actually happened. And um, the other thing I'd like to say is that, um, in my opinion, when the state wants to carry out actions that are illegal, what it does is it compartmentalises the action. So, um, if we take the example of um, the Nazis exterminating the Jews, you have some policemen who initially rounded up the Jews and <coughs> hand them over to the train driver. The train, all the train driver is doing is driving them to the, the concentration camp. Then you've got the guy who unloads them. Then you've got the guy who puts them in the barracks. Then you've got the guy who turns the oven on. But no one is actually doing the whole process. And by content, you know, putting these compartments, um, all, it makes it easier for the individual to be a part of these actions because they can say to themselves, we're all I do is drive a train, all I do is turn the oven on. And, and also it separates it so maybe they don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, when I was in Iraq, um, our superiors were very keen to make sure that we weren't a part of interrogations. So we, our job, was to um, find these people and bring them back to our base. Then we had some guys who worked with us who carried out what was the, the initial interrogation back at base. Obviously, whilst we were on the ground, we would interrogate people, you know, very quick questioning, shouting, you know, trying to find out information. But the real interrogation would start when we got back to base, and that was done by someone else. And, and I think that the re and then after they'd done an initial interrogation, that it would be decided which prison or which detention facility these people would go to, and then interrogations would be carried out there. And then by separating these processes out, like for example, if more of if if myself and my colleagues were involved in the further interrogations and the torture, it might prevent us from taking people out of their houses because we'd think, oh, I can't do that. I can't take them out of their house for them to be tortured. But because we weren't involved in the actual torture, it, it makes our job easier. And I think that's what's happened in Iraq, is that lots of people are just doing their job. You know, I'm just doing my little bit. But when you put all those jobs together and see what, the, what actually happens, then, then you get a true picture of what happens. Did you get any idea then? Um, were you aware of anything? I mean, three, of my, three very good friends of mine um, actually witnessed an interrogation where a cattle prod and uh, partial drowning were used. Um, our superiors were going into these detention facilities and coming back with information, and they left us in no doubt that you know that the interrogation methods used were, you know, harsh. Um, there's been other evidence that's come out that obviously, you know, not my own personal, from not from my own personal experience of torture carried out in places like Camp Nana and uh, Bali Special Forces Base. So I think it's, it's well established that that was going on. Um, we weren't part of the torture, we weren't part of the interrogation, we were supplying the people for it. That's all my role. You say that you, um, when you went into the houses, you took a number of different things, including young men of military age. Um, what would happen to those men? Right, so, you, I, I described one job, and you, know, you can ask questions about that. So, on, on one job, we went into a small hamlet. Um, I think it was near Fallujah, and uh, we rounded up all the males from, there must have been about, I can't remember, maybe 10 buildings in this hamlet, and we rounded all the males up and, and we put them at the helicopter landing site where we were going to take them all in. So you had a, a range of males from sort of maybe, maybe 15, 16, you know, maybe that sort of young, up to sort of 60. And then um, out of those males, um, they'd all come back with us, they'd be initially interrogated, and then the interrogator would decide. Um, what level of um, 
what, their, at what level they were assessed at for intelligence value or for their role in insurgency. Um, some people would end up in somewhere like Abu Ghraib, which is like a, a, a big prison, um, and they could be held there without charge for maybe three months and then released back to where we've been picked up from. Other people who felt deemed to be a high, higher intelligence value would go to say somewhere like Camp Nama or Battle Special Forces Base where they'd be put into a, a more uh, robust interrogation process. Um, so, so that's, there was a, a range of options available. Um, on one occasion we were actually tasked with taking people back, so we brought, I can't remember how many people it was, covered helicopter loads of people back to our base and then we were told no, we don't want one, two, three, four, five, these people taken back. So we, we take them back to the, um, the village we pick them up from. But I often think about that as well, you know, if, if you take all the males out of the village and then you take five back five hours later or four hours later, what, sort of, what does that do to the people in the village? You know, they think, oh, what have you guys done? Have you sold out the other people? You know, have you given, have you been bought off? Have you given the Americans intelligence about what was going on? You know, like creating that sort of suspicion within communities as well, I think, like sending people back. Like On these intelligence, were medics present? Medics, yeah. And did they deal with the people that may have become injured as a result of the incursion? Yeah, I mean, casualties would be, um, would be dealt with, you know. On site, or would they take them away? On site. Um, it, I wasn't involved in any operations where, where that was a problem. Um, so I'm not sure what would have happened if we'd have injured. I'm not sure what would have happened if we'd have injured someone making entry into a building or something like that. Uh, where, they, where, where, where the medical cover would come from. Um, uh, okay, um, <coughs> first, first of all, just, just to qualify, you know, I very much understand your position. My dad was, um, was a major in the Royal Marines, so I grew up in barracks, so I very much appreciate the military perspective, although I'm on the peaceful campaigner side now. Um, it's all one side of the planet. My first question was, did the troops actually question during your tour to out there, the legality of the war. Did this come up in conversation around Barrett or, you know, after a certain amount of time? The legality of the war, so you're talking about the initial invasion to the invasion, did we have the right to go in there, or was it, you know, initially we were told very much so we had the right, but after a certain amount of time, did people start to question? I think people questioned more what we were doing out there. Mm. So we'd come back in off a job, and you'd be sat in a room with, or I'd be sat in a room with three other guys, and we'd, you know, be just looking at each other, thinking, "What the fuck was all that?" About? Um, so I think there was that. When I um, when I refused to go back to Iraq, and I was interviewed by um, five officers, one of the officers told me that at the time of the invasion, he was working in Whitehall, and that there were discussions at a very high level about the legality of the war. I think amongst the officers and amongst uh, senior officers, there was this this worry that what they were doing could possibly be illegal. Mm. Okay, well, so it's uh, the different levels, pressing into different uh, stages or level within the uh, forces. Um, my second question would be about the law. Obviously, times of war are <coughs> certain different situations, but um, how much uh, effort was given to make sure that the rule of law in some form was was adhered to such as trials for detainees. You mentioned they could be held without a charge for up to three months. I think in this country, uh, up to 72 hours, I think that is a change order. Um, so the question really, you said about compartmentalising things. The question really is, uh, how much were you briefed on the rule of law and you know, on, on trials for detainees? Did every did every detainee, you heard earlier from Dr. al Sakawi about 400,000 People detained or imprisoned, were they all entitled to a trial? Uh, 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 but only after three months? What was the rule of law? The, the three months is just a, a rough guide. It's, I think there were people who held without charge for, for years, you know, and I think three months was a, was a limit. Um, so people were held without trial for longer, yeah. for years. And, and is that the rule? It, 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 laws, of the law, laws of war is the normal, whatever you'd call it, rule of law suspended in a war zone, you don't have to give people trials? Uh, well, no, war, I mean, my understanding, you know, I'm just a simple soldier rather than a yeah, yeah, my, my understanding of it is, 
And he said, once you become the occupying power in a country, then it is your responsibility to enforce the rule of law. And um, as far as I'm concerned, that you know, we, we should have been enforcing the rule of law as it was in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my arguments or one of my, uh, with an officer out there was that what we were doing in Iraq, we would never have done in Northern Ireland. Um, now, we were in Northern Ireland for over 30 years, and the stuff we were doing in Iraq, we would never have done there. And he said, oh, this is Iraq. I mean, there was, there was a, there was a... I'm sorry, did you not ask him what he meant by that? <clears throat> this is Iraq. Was that acceptance? Uh, intolerable behaviour was acceptable? Well, there was a, an underlying... Um, I wouldn't say fear. There was an underlying um, racism that these people were subhuman. Um, whether that's part of military training, which tries to dehumanise the enemy, or whether it's because they were a different religion, different culture. Um, at the time, a lot of the... And I was working in an American area with a lot of American soldiers, you know, so that was what my experience was. Um, a lot of the Americans there were, were on a mission. You know, they were almost on a crusade. Um, they thought that somehow Iraq was involved in 9-11, and they thought they, they thought they were getting revenge on 9-11. Um, they had this sort of, you know... So there was this underlying racism that these people weren't to be treated the same as us. I think that, that, that was definitely there. And my last question was, so, uh, do you feel that the uh, Geneva Convention was respected as, as, as a soldier? You know, obviously, if, if we want other countries to respect us when we're in prison, to respect the Geneva Convention, do you feel the Geneva Convention on treatment of prisoners was respected by UK forces while they're out there? Actually, no. before you answer that, do, do you have an awareness as a soldier of the Geneva Conventions? I mean, are you briefed on Right, I, th I think whilst you're, in, whilst you're in training, so uh, I was in parachute regiment when I was in training, um, you undergo intense training with sleep deprivation. And at some point during that six months, you are given a lecture on the Geneva Convention. It's usually a good time to get some sleep, you know. So, <laughs> so yes, it is given, you know, the Geneva Convention or the, the rules of law, the, the laws of war are in part, but it's a tiny, tiny um, part of training. And from, from my own experience, my own experience was that the, we had lawyers with us, there were lawyers in the army. My experience with them was that they, were, they weren't there to remind us of our obligations, they were there to circumvent the obligations. So before, every, um, before we went out on operations, we were always reminded that as British soldiers within this joint task force, we were not to arrest anyone, we were to detain them. And we had an American soldier with our small unit to actually be the arresting officer. And um, this was this point was having time to us. You know, the Geneva Convention was at this point was having time to us. And this, for me, I thought that this was some sort of legal way of, so that we could deny any responsibility for what happened to these people later. We didn't arrest them, you know. And so I think that's, if there was any time and effort put into um, a, a sort of like, you know, looking into the legal ramifications of what we were doing, it was more likely put into, right, how can we avoid being um, caught up in this, you know, in a sort of legal mess. Um, when we had joint briefings in a room not dissimilar to this, you know, um, we had different rules of engagement uh, to our American colleagues. So our rules of engagement were that you had to be um, threatened with deadly force to use deadly force. So someone would have to point the rifle at you before you could shoot them. Or you had to, you know, it's quite a high standard before you, you could open fire. Um, and in the same briefing, the guy had taken the order to say, and obviously, then says the Americans would say, and we're a bit of a laugh, you know, and we all know what your rules of engagement are. Right? Their rules of engagement were slightly different there as well. If you feel threatened, you can open fire. And that's a big difference between deadly force being presented towards you and, um, you know, that you felt threatened by something. Um, if you're making an incursion into a property and blowing up the doors, yeah. as soon as you enter that property, you must be in fear of that. Well, with a, you know, that's the point, isn't it? And I, I think now um, that as we were in coalition and that we were all quite responsible for what was happening on those jobs, that we should have been saying, wait a minute, this, 
there wasn't enough effort that I don't think put into um, trying to enforce the rule of law and, and question what we were doing as a unit. Bear in mind that we were a joint unit, we should have been doing that. But then I think there was that argument before we went into Iraq that somehow the British forces would act as a break on the Americans, and that uh, you know we would prevent them from acting excessively. But we, we were ten percent of their hundred percent. And um, what actually happened was the opposite. We became more like them. Um, and I think that's what happened, you know, like the sort of pressure of being involved in a much bigger unit that was basically in charge.